Good evening, and a very warm welcome to our colleagues, students, and visitors to UEA this evening. My name's Professor Fiona Lettis, and I'm Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research and Enterprise here at UEA. Um, and I'm delighted this evening to be um, introducing our inaugural lecturer, Professor Gerard Parr. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about Gerard before um, we hear him speak. He holds the full chair in telecommunications engineering and is our head of School of Computing Sciences here at UEA. He got his PhD in self-stabilizing protocols, I had to read that, at Ulster University. And as part of his studies, he worked with one of the founding fathers of the internet, Professor John Possel, when he was a visiting research scientist at the University of Southern California, um, the Information Sciences Institute in Marina del Rey, Los Angeles. Within his academic career, Gerard's research has been at the cutting edge of developing new systems for computer networking, data acquisition, and data transfer protocols. He has attracted several million pounds of external and commercial research funding, and has advised governments on the allocation of funding to large-scale projects which total approximately 2.5 billion pounds. He collaborates academically with colleagues at institutions in the US, India, and China, as well as lots of other UK-based universities. More recently, he's been successful in attracting funding under the US-Ireland Research and Development Programme, along with the National Science Foundation in America, in the area of agile photonics for massive data analytics. Since arriving at UEA just a short while ago in August 2016, Gerard has embarked on an exciting initiative to establish the China-UK Technology Innovation Centre, which involves top universities from both countries, as well as industry partners such as BT Research and Innovation. The centre will focus on collaborative research in the Internet of Things, cloud computing, data analytics and 5G wireless technologies. In terms of UK-based initiatives, Gerard is currently a co-principal investigator in a project which brings together academics and industry professionals from a range of disciplines, electrical engineering, electronics, communications, networking, mathematics and computer science technology, so truly interdisciplinary. In his talk tonight, Gerard's going to explore the benefits and challenges presented by the internet in modern society, bridging divides or losing control. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Gerard Parr to give his inaugural lecture. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks a million for, for coming here this evening. Uh, I'm not sure whether to put the Queen video back on again and we continue there because that was, that was really good. Uh, I'm going to take you on a little journey tonight. Uh, part of it's looking back on the people who have influenced me, but it's also taking a look at the, the connected society that we're now part of, uh, at least some of us are part of, uh, and I'll try and indicate some of the touch points in terms of challenges and so on that we face as a society, and also the opportunities. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, I'm not asking you to read this slide because if this was a lecture, I'd fire myself because there's too many things on the slide. I want to highlight the things in green. Um, Fiona has already alluded to, to Professor John Postel, and I'll speak a little bit more about John uh, from the University of Southern California. Uh, John was a big, big part of my early career uh, and influenced me a lot in terms of my research. But cutting right to the bottom, uh, I'm conscious that uh, our Vice Chancellor took over 20 years before he gave an inaugural lecture. Uh, I've only been here since the 22nd of August 2016. So something has happened. I'm not quite sure if I've been caught early or I've been let off the hook. So anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. But in terms of where I'm from, uh, I'm originally from uh, South Down, County Down in Northern Ireland. Uh, that's a map of the location. The bottom right hand side is actually the, the village that I'm from. Uh, you can see similarities with Norfolk, uh, some small hills. Uh, and the top left hand side is, is, is the mountains of Mourne, actually, is, is, the, is the zone. Beautiful area, and it's all, also interconnected with the Lake District. So if you've ever been to the Lake District, geographically and geologically, they are connected. Uh, and I see Jenny in the audience somewhere coming in. I'm sure she'll correct me. Um, but my current family home, uh, unfortunately my, my wife Heather and two other daughters, uh, Charlotte and Sophia, are not able to be with us tonight because they're in Port Stewart. Uh, and literally that beach on the top right hand side is, is the backdrop to where we live. Uh, anybody from Rathlin Island, if, if uh, Matt Gage is here, our research director from the faculty, Rathlin Island is in the background on the bottom right hand side. Bottom left is the Giant's Causeway, which you may have heard of. 
uh, around the North Antrim coast. Some of these views, the top left uh, is actually the beach beside where my uh, current family home is based, Port Stewart Strand. The top right hand side, for those of you who are into Game of Thrones, uh, some of these areas are actually part of the, the scene setting for Game of Thrones. Uh, bottom left hand side is uh, uh, Downhill, and the bottom right hand side is Dunluce Castle, uh, where some centuries ago the Scottish actually invaded Northern Ireland at one time. Uh, but this is the scenery in which I'm coming from. Uh, I just want to set some scenes now in terms of the internet. What does it mean to you as a society? So we haven't actually asked you to turn off your phone since you came in here this evening. Uh, but I'm wondering if you have a phone, could you put it on, your, on the desk in front of you? We will collect them later on. <laughs> and uh, you're not getting them back. So if that be the case, do you think you could cope? And we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. But this slide, you know, is just an indication. There are many cartoons out there which are highlighting the way we've become so dependent on being connected uh, to the internet in all its various guises. Uh, it's jokey, but there's some serious messages in there because the internet has become a digital crutch for many people. Many people in different parts of society, many people in different parts of business and the economy, and indeed governments. But we have a lot of challenges still to, to, uh, to cater for. So let's look at, take a little bit uh, of a history lesson here in terms of the, the formation of the internet. Uh, the internet has been around for some time. Uh, it really kicked off post the 1940s in the Cold War when the USSR launched the Sputnik satellite. And that got fantastic reviews, and this was the forerunner of the space race, as, as some of you may be familiar with. But what this did was focused minds, specifically in the American government. Uh, and as it happens, this was what formed the Advanced Research Projects Agency. So it was very much a Department of Defense, a military experiment, that led to some of the innovations that we take for granted today. Now, it is unfortunate, it's a byproduct, and it still happens that a lot of money goes into defense research, uh, but there are humanitarian and societal uh, spin offs from that uh, that are for good, not, not, not for, for bad. But in the 1957 launch of the Sputnik, that certainly focused minds, and it gave rise to a major push to find out ways by which the various establishments could connect could share information in order to start this race or maintain the race with, with colleagues in Russia. This is a busy slide, but all I want you to do is look, if you can, at the red dots in the middle. You'll see a photograph there of Vint Cerf. Uh, and on the right-hand side here, you'll see another red dot for John Postel. So in that timeline of 1962 to 1992, Vint Cerf, as many of you will know, is the grandfather of the internet, so-called, but he had a number of colleagues in that gang. John Postel was one of them. Uh, and as already been alluded to, I did part of my PhD under the mentorship of John Postel. He was an absolute fabulous man, an absolute genius. Uh, and what he did to push some of the underlying protocols that are transparent, that are never seen, that help formulate the fabric on which the internet has now been built uh, were formidable. Uh, John with Steve Crocker, uh, Mike Wingfield, Bill, uh, Bill Naylor and Vince Cerf and also Leonard Kleinrock. Anyone who's into queuing protocols and networks, Leonard Kleinrock uh, was, was a real you know, bastion of, of setting the scenes and setting the standards. But these folk collectively uh, were inspired by the need to do something different and they had funding. That's the other key thing. The US Department of Defense was putting serious money into this because there was a risk. Uh, there was image, uh, image at, at hand and also a challenge to look at some of the engineering solutions that would make the US to be at the forefront of the, the telecommunications age. But John Postel worked. The bottom right hand side shows Steve Crocker, Vince Cerf and John Postel uh, it may look quite a gimmick, but you have Asia, North America, Europe, uh, and Africa connected by pieces of string, or in this case, sausages uh, on, 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 and, and tins. Uh, 
But these folk, when you think about what they did at the time, this was really, really, really pushing the boundaries. Uh, John Postel unfortunately died on October 16, 1998. Uh, and one of the key sayings he had, be liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you send. Uh, think about that in today's society of texting, SMS, uh, Facebook updates, instant messaging, email. How many people have sent emails late at night when they were in a rage or tired and then the next morning they thought, mm, what a pity, so sorry, you can't take it back. But nonetheless, John was, was uh, a real, a real uh, scene setter and some, when someone like Vince Cerf has given this sort of comment, you can see where he sat in, in, the, uh, in the gang. Interestingly, John was not the only one from the impact of the internet in its formative years globally. We had some local champions. Uh, one of them was Peter Kirstein, based at UCL, who went to Stanford with the head of DARPA at the time. And when he returned to the UK uh, to be based at University College London, John brought with him those very, very important connections. And as part of the growth of the so-called initial ARPANET, or European version of the ARPANET, Peter Kirstein was quite influential. Uh, in 1976, uh, he was the one that helped Her Majesty send the first email across the system. Uh, Queen Elizabeth was the first to send an email across the infrastructure, uh, as, is, as is the case. But that was a, quite a pivotal moment in terms of what we take for granted today and how many billions of emails are going backwards and forwards across the Atlantic. Here is a photograph of uh, Peter Kirstein winning the Mar Marconi Society Prize at the Royal Society in London 2015. Uh, and the thing is, he's standing beside Vince Cerf. Uh, now the reason Vince Cerf uh, is there with Peter Kirstein because they were colleagues in action. Uh, but the other thing is Peter Kirstein was my PhD external examiner. Uh, so that influenced me in, in the early years uh, and so the notion of the internet as we have it now, all I'm trying to emphasize is that the fabric was around and has been around since the 1960s, uh, primarily as a research initiative for the military, but then gradually it became more institutionalized and commercialized and for better research purposes themselves. And when you look at this, this is a 2010 global traffic map. The red lines indicate the flow of traffic over submarine cables. Now, you can see that there are main uh, thoroughfares between the West Coast and Asia and the East Coast and Europe, in particular coming into the UK. Uh, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that, but even though this is 2010, in 2017 we do have a little bit more traffic going around the Horn of Africa and over to Indonesia. But the main bulk of the data is still going across these, these major thoroughfares. Now that map is, in, is quite interesting because if we go to the submarine map, and I'm not sure if you can see it uh, where you're sitting, but uh, the lines going across are submarine cables. Uh, they've been laid for, for uh, many years, some of them in, from Victorian times going around the empire. But nonetheless, these are the highways by which all of the emails, texts, Skype conferencing, WebEx, you name it, are transmitted across the world. Not everything is going via satellite because it's too expensive. Uh, but these high-speed uh, optical fibers that are sitting on the seabed are, are very, very strategically important to the economy of the globe. And so many companies are in there vying to get access to them, to carry their data. But in many cases, they are the lifeblood of the stock market, uh, governments, and dare I say, security agencies. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But this infrastructure that's out of sight, out of mind, is carrying so much important traffic for the economies, for governments, and for society. Uh, these are the assets that we have to protect. And this is another theme that we need to be aware of from the viewpoint of resilience and fault tolerance. So as we look around us to the network, I've asked you to hand over your phones and you may or may not get them back in a couple of weeks. Uh, the reason that you feel torn is that you become accustomed to that level of connectivity and that asset in your hand. 
uh, so-called so martini services any time, any place, anywhere with any device. That's what we've become accustomed to. But we need to protect it. And when you scale that up from your mobile phone send, making a phone call to someone in San Francisco, someone in New Zealand or Australia, uh, invariably it could be going across this type of infrastructure at some point over the wide area connections. Uh, size does matter. I don't want to bore you with the, the, the metrics, but you'll hear of exabytes and uh, petabytes and terabytes. Uh, the scale just keeps growing in terms of how much data humanity is generating. And it's now moving not just human-generated content, but machine-generated content. We have sensors everywhere of every variety. Uh, we monitor vehicles, we monitor animals, we monitor humans, we monitor buildings. Uh, the list goes on, but every time you're monitoring something, you're capturing some data about that, the scale of which is growing exponentially. Uh, that data has to be captured, it has to be stored, it has to be transmitted, it has to be processed, uh, and therein there's some business to be had. Uh, if you're a vendor who's manufacturing this type of equipment, bring it on. Uh, there's, there's money to be made. But the question sometimes does have to be asked, how much of that data is really valuable? Uh, is it of any sense? Uh, I'm not going to slag off any members of my family at this point. Uh, incidentally, my oldest daughter is sitting in the audience. So... Uh, I don't spy on your phone, I don't spy on your emails and your Facebook account, but some of the content, one has to ask the value of it. Um, <laughs> anyway, you're giving me a lift home, so I'll not say any more. Um, but the whole thing about the growth of data is, is just constantly, these numbers are out of date. But I think the key point of this particular uh, Cisco uh, f document here was, more people will have more mobile phones than electricity at home by 2020. Now that's a startling statistic when you think of which is more important, electricity, running water, food, mobile phone. Uh, I have worked extensively in India for over 10 years and the thing that always struck me was that the, the lights were always going off. Um, the water, you would not necessarily drink it all the time. Uh, I realise that people in the UK and Ireland are very spoiled when they complain about things. Uh, but nonetheless, everybody had the top of the range mobile phone, in some cases a better phone than I had. Uh, watching Bollywood movies and cricket. Obsessed by it and willing to pay the subscriptions for it. Yet, uh, you were thinking, where is the prioritisation of what is important to me as, as a human? And it depends where you are in your own context and situation. But I am not shocked by this. In fact, I thought it would have been more, but nonetheless, these are indicative uh, values, but it shows you where the priorities lie globally when we're looking at you know, people with phones, running water and electricity. But nonetheless, we're not all lucky. Not everybody is connected to the internet. Uh, various statistics coincide here, but we're talking about four billion citizens of the globe who are not part of this digital party. Uh, and there are various reasons for that. Um, you can take a look at this from Hootsuite. You know, it's 57% in East Asia. Africa is particularly bad at 29%. Now, people can argue about the statistics, but the trends are always the same. Uh, South Africa, in particular, is, is better, but as you go into mid-Africa and into, into the regions, things become very difficult, and I'll touch on that later. But Central Asia, 48%, Indonesia as well. So you can see that there's a bulk of humanity that are not benefiting from all of this fantastic uh, infrastructural investment. Uh, and that has all sorts of knock-on consequences for people who live in those particular regions. Linked to that, we think of the sustainability goals that have come out from the United Nations. Uh, Ban Ki-moon. ICTs can be an engine for achieving sustainable development. They can power this global undertaking. Um, that's okay if you have the money to pay for it. That's okay if you have a system by which you can raise revenue um, through taxation and so on uh, to pay for this infrastructure. 
Uh, with the best will in the world, the companies who have the technologies who can make an impact, they're not a charity. They can only go so far. They have to have money coming in to invest in research and development to get the next version of particular product and service. But nonetheless, there's still a lot that we can do today without any necessary additional funding other than the will of governments uh, and incumbent societies in these countries to take this technology and use it for good. So there, there are 17 main goals, but when you start looking at four of the big things that really stand out, affordability, the actual infrastructure itself, skills and awareness, and cultural acceptance and local adoption. If we take a look at those in particular, um, you could say, well, is this just for Africa or Indo Indonesia? Do any of these impact on the UK? Are there parts of Wales, Cornwall, Norfolk, uh, Ireland, Highlands and Islands of Scotland, where some of these challenges are equally the same? Maybe the context is slightly different. Lack of skills and awareness is something that's I mean, I have uh, been looking at this for many years. I was on the Ofcom advisory board for Northern Ireland. Um, and you could see that, you know, there were still gaps in educational provision post-14 in some of the large conurbations in the large towns and cities. And you would think, okay, in a town like Belfast, but then how does that translate to Bristol? How does it translate to Nottingham and Edinburgh? There are always pockets of deprivation in various uh, locations of population, even in so-called developed countries. The question is, what do we do about this? Uh, and I'm sure you're all familiar with various initiatives that are happening regionally, nationally and internationally to address that. But the one on the bottom right hand side here I find particularly interesting. Local adoption, uh, there are many inhibitors to that. Uh, if you look at this particular slide, uh, on the bottom right hand side, online content is only available in one of ten languages. How many languages are there in the world? You start to think of regional dialects, more remote parts of, of communities in, in rural areas in South America and in Africa, India and indeed in China. Uh, and you start thinking, if we put in the infrastructure, would that be enough? If we can power it, is that enough? Uh, do, we assume, do we assume the people are trained to actually make use of this technology? Uh, so there are so many assumptions that have been made in the past and have led to failure because there was no engagement, no reaching out to the local community, uh, no content being contextualized to suit their particular needs. The other startling statistic, you know, lack of skills and awareness. Um, you come down here and you think women are up to 50% less likely to be connected in some of these areas. And you ask yourself, why is that the case? In some cases, in many cases, uh, the ladies are more intelligent than the men. Uh, in fact, I know that to be true everywhere. Just, just to be sure. Uh, but in these particular areas, they're just not getting the chance because of various cultural barriers. Now, how do you break that down? You can't just parachute in technology, uh, the latest equipment, and, and have a photo shoot and say how great and wonderful we are and then walk away. There are various other cultural nuances that we really have to get under the hood to understand this notion of optic and acceptability. But I find that a particularly... Uh, interesting statistic uh, and it's again something that as an engineer we're not best placed to tackle that. We need multidisciplinary engagement from social scientists, anthropologists uh, and other uh, disciplines to help us understand how the uptake of our technology can be, can be increased. I mentioned the languages, the top 10 languages in the internet. Is there any languages obvious to you that are missing from here? English is there, okay, English, Empire, Commonwealth, call it what you like, good business. Think of a large country and then think of what it speaks. 
Yeah. Yeah. Country the size of, in, of, of India with various dialects. To my mind, the last time I was told there were 140 different dialects. Never mind just saying we'll speak Hindi. So, does that make it arrogant that we say you shall speak English? You shall use an English interface. You shall become familiar with all of the software that's written in English. How does that increase optic um, innovation diffusion in a particular zone if we haven't even contextualized it to suit the folk that need it most? Because in many cases, it's locally generated content for local consumption. They don't need exterior content. Some of the remote, most remote areas don't trust external content. They want to have it from someone that they know in their language, in their dialect. Uh, and that's important for services like video conferencing, uh, telehealth, and so forth. And again, these are uh, issues that really need to be tackled if we're going to start to eat away at that four billion plus number of people who are, who are currently disenfranchised from our digital world. So the global state of the nations, and again, from my acknowledgements, the World Economic Forum and other agencies have been very helpful in letting me use some of their materials. But you think of the so-called Network Readiness Index, and this is a measure that has been going on for several years that there's an audit of all the CEOs of all the major companies around the world and government agencies, where they actually take a root and branch review of every country to get a sense of how connected are they, how network friendly are they? What about their underlying regimes that they have as a country? So from environment to usage, uh, individual business usage, government usage, is the government on a path of putting everything on the internet, so-called e-government? Uh, is that something society has asked for? Is all parts of society benefiting from that, engaging from that? So if I asked everybody in the audience, are you all connected at home and can you insure your car from home? Uh, do you trust the network that's doing that? Uh, can you conference loved ones from home? Uh, do you think that all the government services that you need are available through a portal, through a server, through a network connection? Are there services that you think, I would rather go and talk to someone? I'd rather go physically into a room and have a one-to-one -one so you start thinking about that in a UK context and then you move that to Rwanda. You move that to Chad and you think of other countries that are out there who are trying to mimic what we're doing in the so-called West, Western developed civilizations. But there are various challenges they have to score across the various indices that are, that are up here. The one on the top right, second from the, from the top, political and regulatory environment. That's a minefield. You think of many countries around the world where the regulatory environment is the last thing on their mind, never mind political stability. Now, that has all sorts of knock-on consequences when we come along with our checkbook, our investment, and we pull up the 40-foot truck full of equipment and say, where do you want it? Uh, chances are within 24 hours it will be stolen, it will disappear, it will be sold in the black market. Other uses will be uh, found for it. Uh, and I'm not naming any countries in particular, but that's what happens, unfortunately. So looking at this index, then you think of, you know, let's look at the political regulatory environment, infrastructure, affordability, the skills and awareness, all of the top level headlines that I've mentioned before that really do have an impact on how society absorbs some new innovation and how they actually use it for their own benefit. Uh, we're chatting here now about civilian, commercial, non-military applications, things for the good of society. Uh, if we drape on top of that, or shall I say, behind it, uh, to what extent can um, those with military aspirations make use of the same investment in technology to do naughty things and silly things and horrible things. Uh, in some cases, the technology is dual use, uh, and that's something we need to be very, very aware of. But nonetheless, looking at readiness, environment, usage, and impact, those four big areas are what we try to measure 
across all of the various countries in the world, at least to get a sense of where have they been, where are they now, and where are they projected to go to, and where do we need to come along with some intervention uh, strategies and, and investments. So the top 10 countries, I don't think you'll be surprised by the top 10. This was from 2016 World Economic Forum rankings. Singapore is nearly always at the top. And you ask yourself, how big is Singapore? What is the population of Singapore? What is it that they're able to do that we can't do? Um, why is Hong Kong not there? Why is Luxembourg not there? Um, at the top, it's down there at number nine. But the issue is how the government, the support regime, the taxation policy, but also where does the government prioritize what it wants to do and then it gets on with it. It doesn't have to go through multiple different committees and consultations and so on and so forth that last two or three years. They know what has to be done and they get on with it. And they're succeeding as a consequence. And you take a look at their economy as well. There is a good strong correlation between how their economy is doing, in case most of these economies, and their investment in infrastructure. Now, a couple of slides coming up here, and there are people in the audience, I'm really afraid to put them up, because I'll be shot. Um, hopefully not. The top movers, Italy to Ethiopia, from uh, 130 to 120. So there are countries that have been seen to be um, rather lacklustre in their performance, are gradually coming up the rankings. Now, having said that, and this is another issue, a lot of these countries have other problems on their minds. They have other concerns that where the notion of a technology investment is not really a priority, or at least you could, you could argue against that they're doing well in spite of all of the socioeconomic problems they have. But nonetheless, you look at the ones that are most tech savvy, uh, UAE, for example, uh, is really investing heavily in a lot of smart, so-called smart city, connected buildings, smart buildings, connected society. They're putting in infrastructure from ground zero. And of course, they have the money to do that. Uh, but Singapore is, is holding its own. And the UK has been consistently in the top 10 for, for many years. Uh, and, you know, it's a battle. You think of all the different pressures that there are on society and governments today, even in the UK, and we're not even mentioning Brexit as part of this. But now I've said it, uh, there are other issues to contend here in terms of sharing of data, uh, connectivity, and so forth that we need to be looking at. But these are the, the sort of the current standings of some of the top movers and the, comp and the countries that are the most tech savvy. Uh, you look at the top 10, fine, no surprises. Um, the list is quite long. But if I go to the next slide, you look at the bottom from 121 to 139. I've highlighted five countries there in, with a red dot. Are there any things that you think connect them? Or might connect them? doesn't have to just be one thing. You can think of Mother Nature. You can think of rebels. You can think of political instability. Um, uh, well, the first two countries in particular. You can see countries that should have done very well, could be doing very well, but because of uh, human intolerance and stupidity are not doing as well as they could, unfortunately, unfortunately. But we go into the figures a little bit more and you say, well, why are certain countries positioned really badly in this global framework of, of uh, measuring how successful they are being connected to the internet? I look at the top countries for business risk. Uh, now, you could argue that you know other countries that should be on this list. Um, this came from uh, Business Insider. 
I then took a look at some of the Foreign Office data as well. Now, the Foreign Office has a very, very long list. I mean, it would even have Northern Ireland on it, but those days are gone, thankfully. Um, but if you take a look at that list, you see inflation, hunger, drug cartels, civil unrest, ISIS, lack of marginalised poor. Uh, there's one country missing off the list that I have been quite intrigued by. Guess what it is? There are obvious countries, obvious, but this was one that I just pulled out from the list as a business risk. Last takers? Hmm? Nope. <laughs> now, for those of you with a trickler in your back pocket, uh, this is not in any way to insult, but this is the data that I received. Now, I, on the right-hand side, grade them according to the World Economic Forum uh, Network Readiness Index. And the ones that are in trouble, you can see they're, you know, they're 76, 65, 89, 133, and so on. So they're not worried about technology. Technology has, you know, it's not of importance to them. Well, if it is, they don't have the money to, to, to look at it. They have other priorities. But France is 24 out of 139. In fact, 24 is very low for France. So I don't know. I've only been in Norfolk since the 22nd of August. I haven't had the pleasure of going to Felix Stowe or going different places to know if this notion of strikes in France is something that happens from time to time. But however, some of the companies that uh, have been involved in this assessment have seen that that is an issue. Now, to what extent does technology have an influence on this? Does it play a role? Can technology help percolate uh, uh, dissension amongst the ranks? Or can it be a means to provide for uh, equity of access for all? Uh, so these are other issues, again, from an engineering viewpoint, away outside my league, but it's very interesting for me to see how these uh, gradations are working. Top countries for environmental disasters, uh, and Jenny don't shout, but these are the countries on the right hand side which came from the United Nations World Risk Report 2016. Um, the first one is in the Pacific Ocean, uh, a group of, of, of islands, and um, there are all sorts of issues I think Mother Nature does in that part of the world. But some of the countries that are in the top 15 in terms of floods, earthquakes, tsunamis, storms, and other environmental disasters. You bring them across and you take a look at where the network readiness index, how many of these countries have invested in technology, maybe for early warning systems, to communicate with citizens, to help them uh, in, in disaster and emergency response. Uh, and you take a look at India, China. Uh, India, given the size of the countries, China and India, you know, 91 and 59 respectively, those are very, very good figures. Very, very good figures, given the level of investment that they would have to make in the trillions to catch up with other countries. But surprisingly, Japan is in there as well. As a country, as you know, unfortunately, with both environmental and man-made disasters in some cases, and it has a readiness index of 10. Very, very well-equipped country with all of the systems in place. But nature is cruel, and nature has no respect for, for technology. And part of this is then to see how robust and resilient are the systems that are being put in place uh, in order to help societies and countries where uh, Mother Nature can wreak havoc from time to time. So I thought that was just an interesting uh, set of correlations. Now we look at this notion of the control. Uh, do we want to take control of the internet? Uh, do we want to regulate it? What is this internet? Can you touch it? Can I switch it off? Um, you know, can I tell it to go somewhere else? Uh, and you've seen from my earlier slides how the internet has formed and morphed and grown over since the 1960s. And then you say, well, okay, what are the issues to do with regulation? There's all sorts of very bad things going on in the internet. Likewise, uh, 
you go down to B&Q and you get some gardening tools, you can bring them home and use them for the purpose by which you bought them. Unfortunately, others in society could use them for other things. So lots of technology and lots of innovation can have multiple uses, not all as society had expected. But from a research side, from what we do in the university, we're always trying to look at responsibility in research. What is it we're doing that can benefit society and the economy? Doesn't mean that it gets into the wrong hands and humans being human, somebody does something really idiotic. Uh, but we have to mitigate against that. So the notion of taking control, we all know what the threats are. Um, it's quite interesting. Uh, when I was based in the University of Southern California, I had the government give me a, a, a credit card, would you believe, to pay for my expenses. And it was one of those that you had to... And there was the old carbon paper in it. And you would sign it and they would take it off you. They would take a copy, you got a copy, and the black carbon went into a bin. Uh, I recall flying from Los Angeles. Um, and when I landed, I think I was landing back in, in London, um, a couple of days later, I got a call from Northwest Fraud Squad to say that they had arrested a Mr. Eli Daly in the Mission part of Los Angeles, who had in his possession my credit card and had run up thousands of dollars of bills. Uh, needless to say, I spoke some Gaelic, Irish words at the time. I was in shock. How did he have my credit card? Because I had it in my hand. And he had in his garage all of the blank credit cards that he could emboss with, he was a retired, or shall I say disgruntled American Express employee. <laughs> and he had a franking machine. He could do any card you liked. And all he did was he got, there was a waiter in various restaurants and he was more than happy to empty the bins because he had the carbon. It had signature, it had number, it had everything. Now, that's in the mid eighties. So we're worried about internet threats today. The threats have been all around us all the time. They've just taken a different form. Okay, maybe it happens faster now. You don't have to empty the bins as such, okay, for identity theft. But nonetheless, I think we have to contextualize what's going on in society today with our connectedness and what are the threats and what can we do to mitigate against them. And we know all about the you know, different hacks and attacks and so on and the sophisticated software we can put in place. Um, the challenge is never ending, but that's where some of the research that we do in a university context has a, an, at least in an attempt to root out and look for the uh, early warning signs, look for the outliers, look for the exception conditions, look for different data patterns in the network to see if something bubbling up that's not normal at a part of the network that should be quiet. Uh, is that human sourced or has it been sourced by a machine? Is it another piece of software that's generating that particular attack? So there are lots of things out there that we know of. Um, and it's a case of you know, trying to keep up with what the challenges are. We know some of them are horrible in terms of societal impact. Cyberbullying is one of them. Uh, my oldest daughter, Rachel, is here. I have a daughter who's 18 and another one who's 13. And uh, having gone through girls high school, I can see, I think, Rachel, you've gone out on the curve and you weren't really worried about this. I see through my 13-year-old and 18-year-old in particular, my 13-year-old, the content is flying around. My God, it's mind-boggling. But schools and systems are doing what they can to, hand, to try and tackle this. But it is a growing issue. And you ask yourself, is this something that as engineers, as universities that we, that we do, what can we do to stop this? Uh, you're, back, you're now down to human emotion and human behaviour uh, in adolescence, in, in uh, schoolboys and schoolgirls that are 12, even younger than that, and what they do with this uh, agent of delivery called the internet. Some of this is educational, some of it's from the parents at the hearth in their own kitchen to understand and bestow some sensible do's and don'ts with the internet. Uh, but nonetheless, these are, these are worries that we're constantly looking at and trying to root out and challenge. But it does take a very multidisciplinary approach, not just from a university viewpoint, looking at tools and systems, 
not just from the companies that provide the connectivity, but educationalists, social workers, and indeed parents, because as this has said at the bottom, many parents are oblivious. Uh, many kids suffer in silence. And that's very hard to root out. Uh, is there a technical answer to this? I don't think so. We need to come together to try and look at these particular challenges. But these are, if you like, more on the, the darker side. But again, I ask yourself, you know, uh, many people are worried about losing their data on the internet. Um, just like my credit card in the mid 80s being reconstructed and thought, he actually spent 250 pound on red roses in uh, uh, Santa Monica. Now, luckily I wasn't married at the time, but uh, $250 in red roses on somebody else's credit card. I thought that was quite, quite a good move. <laughs> uh, but here on the, this was uh, Charles and Diana's medical records found in a, a filing cabinet that had been handed in that was sold. A batch of secret anti-terror files discovered on a train. That was 2008, the train to Waterloo. This goes on. You hear these stories all the time. Some civil servant or some professional in a rush, stressed out, leave their pen drive, leave the files, leave their briefcase, leave their phone. You're down, it's down to human error. You cannot protect and mitigate against all of these things with a technical solution. But all I'm trying to stress here is that things go wrong all the time. Uh, and it's normally when there are humans in the loop, to be honest. So regulating the internet, uh, we don't think it's a good idea. It's very difficult to regulate the internet. There are things you can do, mind you, in terms of interventions that we can make uh, to do things better. But to have, the, to have permission free innovation, it has to be an open innovation platform. Uh, we can then start to look at how people are using it, for what purpose, what type of content, what systems we put in place to monitor that content, and how is that content being consumed? We can start to look at tools and systems and methods, and this is where machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, has, a role, has a role to play. But from the internet society that has been formed as a global entity, they're very much of the mind that we shouldn't try and regulate and put laws in place. Uh, some countries do that themselves uh, for various reasons. Uh, so closing the internet is not the solution. Uh, in fact, sometimes it would have the completely opposite effect because if we switch off um, internet access on this campus, doesn't mean someone can't get access through a mobile network somewhere else or they can't deviate outside this campus and get access through another service provider. So there are always going to be routes into the network. They could even get a satellite phone if they're willing to pay for it to get access globally to the internet. So we have to be very careful about why would you want to shut down, restrict access to the internet, for what purpose? Is it for something of national security? Is it to protect citizens? Is it for the common good? Uh, and in many cases there are examples of where it has a knee-jerk reaction to events that have been happening on the ground. The Arab Spring was one of them. Uh, and here the government decided that in many ways the technology was being used to percolate and group citizens to come in and fight against the government. Now, I'm not saying yes, no, maybe, good or bad. I'm just saying in this particular instance, a national government decided that it had the what with, the capability and also the legal right to shut down access to the internet. But that has huge implications for society. Uh, huge, huge implications for uh, recovery, injury, hospitals, the way people work. And as I said at the start of this, if I take your phone off you for a week, uh, you may not be best pleased. The whole country was completely disconnected. But yet they find a way to connect to other fabric uh, and root out their cause. And, and we know what happened as a consequence. But these are examples. But there's also good examples of the internet doing good for society. It's not all bad, it's not all negative. You know, uh, support for mental health, social inclusion, uh, where we can have small robots in the home for somebody with dementia or Alzheimer's. 
If they're living alone in a rural area, do we give them that technology as a digital crutch? Or do we just leave them alone completely and they have a health visitor every day or maybe every couple of days? So there are many fantastic innovations that are going on, many of which are coming out of, of the School of Computing Sciences here with colleagues uh, in Norwich Research Park. But you can see, uh, if you have a, a loved one and their, their relatives are in Australia, New Zealand, San Francisco, and they are able to use some sort of a system to communicate with them, uh, suddenly the telephone has come alive to be able to visualize that call through a video. Uh, has a huge cognitive uh, plus, for, especially for, for elderly, and especially as a stimulant, and you can look up the research papers because I'm not qualified in this, but I think in many situations, having cognitive stimulation can reduce the probability of late onset dementia. Now that's a sweeping statement on those of a medical background may have comments to make, but nonetheless, it has been proven playing games, interacting with robots, interacting with digital technology, especially for the elderly, or others that are maybe younger who have various difficulties, uh, does have a positive benefit. So I want to give that myth the other side of the coin, that it's not all, not all bad. Uh, but I do emphasize this, that you can nip things in the bud. Here is a map of national internet exchange points. And what I mean by that, these are the main points by which internet traffic is coming into every country. Uh, I say to nip in the bud, uh, if this works, this is a live system that connects to where all of the major switches are in the world. Uh, these are like, if you like, the landing station. If I go into London, You go in and you start to see data centers. And you can pick any one of them. Docklands East, Slough. Uh, let's go into Docklands East and see who do we find. And a telehouse is normally the end of an optical fiber where it has come, up, come ashore and has landed. There are the carriers that are connecting through that telehouse carrying internet traffic. So I showed you the map of the world with all the optical fiber and all the connections. They're coming on land and then they're being routed through national highways and byways and they're coming to this so-called telehouse or if you want to call it this like a TARDIS inside lots of very expensive equipment handling billions upon billions of pounds worth of data for various companies, governments and organisations. Now, I don't want to go down any deeper than this but um, I've been to this, the, some of these locations uh, and it's just a point in passing. Uh, I was able to go over and see a manhole cover on the ground and lift it up and look down in where I could see the optical fibre coming in. Now, had I been that person who went to B&Q and got gardening tools and decided to use them for some alternative motive, I could have severed the fibre. Some of those fibres are going into Canary Wharf. They're going into the stock market. Just imagine the fun and games with a hatchet you could have and the economic impact that it would have uh, if you disconnect some of those major trunk cables. Of course, backup resilience has been put in place. There are, there are various multiple routes, but the point about here that I want to make is if we get into the servers, we can see all the traffic that's coming into the UK. And if we wanted to, we could stop it because about 67% of the traffic that's running across the internet is rubbish. Okay, it has no value. It's just, in some cases, it's spam. Uh, and when I say rubbish, it's data that nobody wants to get access to. It's people phishing. They're sending all sorts of spam attacks uh, to various nodes across the network. They, we can identify that. The technology's there. But it takes a legal, uh, almost a ju judicial order to be able to go in and stop that traffic being pushed to your account that the next time you open up your email, there's an email from Auntie, Auntie May, long lost, loved in Australia, and you open it up and immediately you download some malware to your machine that starts logging all the keystrokes that you have. And you're oblivious, how did this happen? I didn't ask for Auntie May to send me an email. 
The point I'm getting at is that we can nip some of this traffic in the bud. Uh, So-called data obesity is, is causing problems for us as, as in, in the global network. But when you take a look at the number of nodes that are across the network carrying all this traffic between countries, it's at those particular points that we can intervene and do things as engineers, as technologists, as computer scientists. But it requires the law to be on our side. Um, as one example, some of the filters that we can put in there, you, you wouldn't get your EasyJet or Ryanair flight confirmation. Uh, in some cases, that could be a good thing. But anyway, um, so that's the sort of, you know, the filters that we can put in could block innocent traffic, so we have to be careful of that. Uh, now, this is where I'm going to get into trouble. My daughter, who's 13, when she last came to visit me, wrote down some of her thoughts. I have read this and I decided I'll not use it and then I thought I will use it. <laughs> Don't force elderly people into joining the internet. They survive long enough without it unless they want to. <laughs> uh, if they switch the internet off, you lose the streak on Snapchat. I'm not on Snapchat, so I don't know. Miss out on gossip from friends. The third one, I didn't know where this is going. Government is brainwashing people to buy weapons instead of putting the money to good use for water or internet. Opportunities. Track where money from charity, I think this is where money from charity goes. More than one million pounds raised each year. I'm not sure which organization she was thinking of. Yet still starving children. Where does the money go? Um, worse, uh, I felt this was the one I wasn't sure about, but People use internet incorrectly, nudes, cyberbullying, uh, use, uh, use text language lots. Yes, I do get texts from my daughters and it's double dutch. It's shorthand uh, gone mad. Bullying, trying to show off in a selfie picture on Instagram where there are 13 year old girls who feel pressurized to show clearless skin, da 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 da, and, and please their followers because of society as well, and boys to show jawline, clearless skin, six pack. Um, anyway, the better part was to contact faraway relatives and friends, learn online, and uh, to come up with an invisible phone to pick up hand movement signs to communicate. <laughs> I think, could there be a research project in that? Uh, that those are third, by the way, Sophia's my daughter just in case you're worried. Um, thoughts from a 13 year old uh, who would be really, really upset if her phone disappeared for more than five minutes. So things at home, let's bring it home. We've done a bit of a journey around the world. Uh, again, from Ofcom. Activities that are cited for, for, for uh, personal importance. And the split here is between the 16 to 24 year olds and the 65 plus year olds. If you take a look at live TV, um, you know, the 65 to 40, 65 plus 46 percent. Uh, phone calls, 70 percent. So the older folk like the traditional ways of having a phone call uh, and watching TV. But then as you come down the different types of media, you can start to see things falling off. Instant messaging, for example. 36% uh, of 16 to 24 year olds and 2% of 65 plus. Perhaps there's an opportunity in there to help older folk look at the virtues of uh, instant messaging uh, because it's cheap. And if you work it out right, it's free. Uh, so there are opportunities there as well. Uh, reported negative effect of spending too much time online. <laughs> now, <laughs> neglected the housework um, not sure. And again, the 16 to 24 year olds felt particularly guilty, if you notice, at 56%. Uh, that's not my experience. Um, missed out on sleep, tired the next day, 72%. Shocking, absolutely shocking. Uh, once you come down here, you start to see things neglected work and job, 37% of 16 to 24 year olds. You start to see things that are mundane, and then you start to see things that are a little bit more serious in terms of the way folk conduct themselves professionally and in their, their job of work. But these again from Ofcom's uh, State of the Nations report 2016, I just thought it was intriguing to see 
the negative impacts of spending too much time online. Unacceptability of device use in social situations. Any surprises here? I'll let you look at it for a couple of minutes. Sixty-five plus going to the cinema and theatre are not impressed by people at the bottom using their phones and all the rest of it. So you can see again there should be no surprises here, but that this split is starting to change. A couple of years ago the same statistic uh, was worse for the 65 plus. So technology is starting to become more pervasive in the 65 plus arena. People are becoming to accept it more and not to be afraid of it for all of the connotations that I've alluded to uh, a moment ago. They are recovered. Uh, this is always a hot topic. You know, where is the network connectivity? Uh, who has what? My neighbour has super fast broadband and I'm 10 feet away from them and I don't. What happened? Uh, I'm willing to pay. And there are all sorts of issues in here. And again, this comes from the Ofcom Connected Nations report. And there are many challenges in here because uh, in the Northern Ireland context, I sit on the Government Broadband Improvement Project Board. Uh, and there are always rural areas that are very difficult to get to. Uh, and just some years ago where farmers would find it difficult to have electricity, uh, they might have had a well, so they had lovely fresh water, but they had no uh, power. Uh, telecoms have, has now become a utility. It's a un universal service obligation. People expect to be connected to the, to the net as a right, just the same as having power uh, and having running water. But there are still challenges here in terms of rural populations, not spots, uh, to what extent companies can come in and invest and to what extent the government need to prioritise where they put their money to de-risk what the companies have to do so that they can put in high-speed fibre to somebody who's sitting three miles from the nearest exchange, four miles from the nearest exchange, or as we used to say in Northern Ireland, on the back of a mountain. Unfortunately, there are no mountains in Norfolk, but I'm sure you know places. So this is a, a never-ending dynamic landscape. It is improving all the time. But there's always a job of work uh, that needs to be done. And just on this particular aspect, uh, there is an innovation strategy uh, call out for those of you that are interested. It's in, it's in the media and it's coming from Bayes. Um, there's also the science innovation audit that's taking place at the moment as well, looking at the nations and regions, but particularly the east of England. So if anybody's interested in that, please drop me a line and I can put you in touch with those things. But the reason I put up these maps is this is all part of the enabling infrastructure for all of the things that we talked about before. Uh, there'll always be parts of, the, of society that are not connected. So we don't have to go to Africa, we don't have to go to Chad, we don't have to go to various parts of uh, in, um, South America. There are places at home that are difficult to, to get access to as well. Uh, but it's an, improving, it's an improving picture. So what are the future set of innovations? Uh, connected everything. Connect uh, your mother-in-law, connect your granny, connect your husband, connect your dog, your cat, uh, and then connect your bicycle. I mean, the list is going on, but the one issue that I do have is that as we're looking at connecting more and more things to the internet, um, the power. Who's powering all of this innovation? Uh, how many times have you been caught with your loved smartphone or tablet device only to discover the battery's about to die? You know, uh, it's a horrible feeling because you were just about to do something very, very important. But with all these connected devices, we ha we're having to come up with smarter innovations to harvest energy, uh, either from the human body or from the sun or from other sources that can enable all of these sensors to continue to live and to operate without any human intervention. That's a huge challenge because we put so much trust in all of these technologies. Um, and speaking to colleagues like, like Dylan here from the Faculty of, of Medicine, if we're wanting to monitor people at home in so-called assisted living 
because they have potential onset of dementia or Alzheimer's or some other uh, issue. Um, and we're, we're trying to support the Department of Health in getting people out of hospital, getting them into residential care, into the home. Uh, that's all fantastic. And they can be monitored 24 7. This is brilliant. Loved ones can be able to Skype in or video call at any moment from anywhere in the world. Fantastic. Until the lights go out, until the power goes off, until the battery dies, until the network disappears. So, as an engineer, I'm part of my um, constant uh, worry is or challenge is the resilience and fault tolerance of what we are building. Are we creating Moving people from a physical crutch to a digital crutch in society, whether it's at home, you're in a car, you're in hospital, whatever it might be, uh, it's just a caveat that I'm not saying everything's sweet and wonderful in what we're doing here. There are major challenges that we as engineers, as research scientists, uh, are having to look at. So connected everything. You know, you're already there. We already have many items in our home and in our cars that are connected. In some cases, we don't even know they're connected. Um, but is it getting out of hand? Is it time to say stop? I mean, just imagine what it's going to be like this Christmas. It's no longer that you have the latest game console for the kiddies to play with. You need to be able to have them conference from the comfort of their toilet in their own suite to friends in New Zealand uh, and play that game from their latest tablet. So the challenges are constantly going on. The level of expectation from the consumer is rising. Uh, but we have, to be, we have to be aware that uh, the network that's carrying all of this data, there are capacity limits in there. We have to be smart in how we move this data around. And we also have to make sure that the darn thing doesn't fail and that people don't lose their lives as a consequence of it. Uh, not being able to connect to Facebook for a week. Some people might get upset. But if you're monitoring someone at home and the monitoring disappears, or you're driving a vehicle and it's a so-called autonomous vehicle, smart connected car, you just sit there and read the paper and let it do what it wants, uh, that implies trust. Uh, but it also implies that nothing's going to fail. At least you hope not. So lots of standards, I won't bore you with details, but in behind that beautiful picture there are lots of standards that are coming from the organizations, the professional bodies that we would work with, in particular the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, uh, the IEEE. They set all of the technical uh, definitions and descriptions of all of the systems that need to be designed, built, deployed and monitored. And lots of technical details go in there, as, as you would expect but they're driving this innovation. And the reason I mentioned standards here, we have to be able to share. There's no point in you getting a device that connects to one part of a network in your house, and then if you move house to a different part of the country, your device can't connect, can't speak. We can't share data, we can't interconnect or interoperate, as, as we say. So the standards in behind the scenes are always coming up as a challenge for us to address and to be able to make sure that what we do can actually interconnect uh, and share, not just in a house, but nationally and internationally. So, what sort of a society are we creating? You know, we're connecting everything in the house. You're gonna have more time to read the paper. Uh, does it come to a point that the technology is starting to turn against you? Will the technology have cognitive ability that it can learn, it can monitor, and it suddenly has an opinion? Um, so, I mean, this is happening. This is not maybe a cartoon here, but we are actually at a situation as, as a company I will not mention that was able to have a use of AI to do online translation between Korean and Japanese uh, and English. Korean and Japanese, Japanese to English, okay? Those were the two steps. Uh, and after several weeks of leaving the algorithms to churn and churn and churn the corpus, the actual database of all of the, uh, the linguistic data, it actually managed to translate directly from Korean to English on its own. 
that they, they bypassed the Japanese. It started to think for itself. It didn't do it perfectly, but you start this notion of thinking machines that have been around for some time. Uh, but we're on the cusp of various innovations, but we also have to be aware that there are um, legal and ethical issues that from an engineering viewpoint, we just want to admit the solutions and get things to work. And, hey presto, fantastic. Uh, there's a legacy and an increasing attention that needs to be placed on, is this the right thing to do? What are the legal safeguards? Um, and what are the legal implications of what we're doing? And autonomous cars is a classic one. Uh, if you work for a company such as Aviva, how are you going to give car insurance in the future? Is this a business opportunity or is this a major risk? I don't want to touch it with a barge pole. Uh, I say Aviva, there are many other competing companies. Da, da, da. Uh, but we have to be careful. Uh, there are all sorts of societal implications for where we're going. Uh, people want to be connected at all times, everywhere. The top of a mountain isn't good enough anymore. Up, flying above the mountain is where we want to go. Uh, if astronauts can do it in space, I want to do it from an airplane. But there are all sorts of social etiquette issues that we need to be, be aware of. Uh, and the notion of Looney Tunes, or Project Loon from Google, uh, it's quite an interesting challenge they've placed themselves in. Uh, but I'm sure many of you would have other thoughts and opinions as to what this could mean. Uh, the ability to have that level of connectivity in very, very remote, in some cases, uh, very hazardous locations is particularly interesting. Uh, there may be business reasons behind Google doing this, but there's also, for us, seeing how the technology can be deployed for good uh, is something that we think we should be looking at. We mentioned the smart car. Uh, the 26th of March, Uber suspended their uh, latest trials on self-driving cars in Arizona. Uh, there was actually a human behind the wheel of the car that crashed, but they weren't touching anything. Um, the intelligent software was doing everything, but something somewhere went wrong. Uh, nonetheless, this raises the other issues about ethical uh, challenges, safety, as well as the engineering and the capability of the software. So we're in that growing and learning and evolving curve when it comes to autonomous systems. But have no doubt that smart vehicles, there are billions of pounds worth of investment going into those at the moment. And we see this as things will improve. But it's no point me being in a smart vehicle, not doing anything and reading the paper and other humans interacting in the normal way. We must all be in a consistent environment, all engaging with the same type of connected objects. So I just want to finish off. There was a recent report from Tech City about the industry that we work in, uh, the Tech Nation 2017. Some very interesting numbers in terms of the digital tech industry's turnover is 170 billion. Uh, that's a huge amount of significance for the UK economy. But when you look at the various regions on the bottom right hand side, we look at you know London, Bristol, Bath, Manchester, Cambridge and Reading, you can see the sort of turnover that's coming in. And there should be no surprises there that there's a lot of uh, population there, a lot of big businesses and things are, are turning over quite well. But if we come closer to home, uh, we can see that in Norwich, the advertised uh, salary is about over £40,000. And there are over 7,500 jobs in the sector. Uh, this is brilliant for us, School of Computing Sciences, graduates, interns, placements. Uh, so the technology sector is vibrant. It's growing. And in particular, it's growing in this region. Uh, Cambridge is about 6,000 more but something tells me that the price of a house in Cambridge is more than Norfolk. Uh, even though the price of a house in Norfolk is a lot more than Port Stewart in Northern Ireland, but that's another story. Um, but in the one at the top right, uh, the quality of life, that's something we always sit from, you've seen the photographs of where I'm from in, in the north of Ireland, quality of life we thought was fabulous. But I have to say, having come here, uh, and haven't been living in Tackleston since August. The quality of life here is superb. Uh, you're all very lucky people, and I'm delighted that this is a region that if uh, somebody saw sense or took a risk in hiring me, 
Uh, maybe after this lecture, it'll not be for too much longer. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a huge amount of opportunity in the region. Uh, I have to sell my own school. Uh, a lot of very capable people, some of them are in the room tonight, and we have a range of research activities going on within the school from vision, colour, AI, machine learning and graphics uh, and medical imaging. So we have research teams but also our courses as well. Uh, undergraduate courses and indeed postgraduate courses at master's level in areas where we're really engaged with industry to make our courses fit for purpose and relating to the needs of industry in the local environment and indeed beyond. And our courses are accredited by professional societies. So if any of you have potential uh, customers for us, please tell them this is where it's happening. Uh, and we work with the best in the world, or should I say the best in the world work with us because we're in that, we're in that boat as well. Some of the projects we're working with, uh, in the past I've had the IUATC with, 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 with India. Um, the bottom right hand side is a particular one. Uh, Prince Michael of Kent, he came to look at a, a transatlantic fibre that we actually interconnected into the north of Ireland, into part of the UK system. Uh, interestingly, the host for that meeting was Lord Bally Edmund, who had a house in Norfolk and died in a helicopter crash a few years ago here in Norfolk. He was the host of that event. But it was, again, looking at infrastructure coming in into the UK that would help in terms of global connectivity. We have a range of projects. Uh, as already alluded to by, by Viona in the, in the UK context, linking up a number of universities and working with early career researchers in our sector in electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, and this is setting the scene for, for what comes next in future career development of PhD students and postdocs in the sector who will go out and make a contribution to society. Project Schaumburg is something, it's a small project we've had and we have opportunities to develop this uh, and take it forward. But again, I'm just showing you that we do have international outreach from within the school itself. Uh, and that's a photograph taken in, Dar in Kalampong, in Darjeeling, in India, which has the highest percentage of landslides in the world. Uh, a very interesting place to go, again, to get a, a sort of a wake-up call about how society cope in the presence of natural disasters. Uh, that's just an example of some of the landslides. And China UK, this is one that's live at the moment with a bunch of universities in the UK and colleagues from BT and Martlesham. And those are some of the institutions that are involved. Again, just to give you a sense of our international uh, outreach in working in areas that are of relevance uh, to both UK and China. Uh, that was a workshop. And I'm coming to the end. Uh, we work with the US on massive data analytics as well. So it's important that we're not just working in a European context and with India and China, but we're also working with colleagues in the United States as well, really pushing the boundaries of where this technology can go in terms of really high-speed networking and massive, massive data analytics. So are you ready for a digital detox? Hand over your phone. There are many reasons why people don't want it. Uh, I won't be able to cope, and those are, are some of them. Um, and I'm sure you could add your own to that list. Uh, so go on, give it a try. <laughs> so with that, I shall leave you. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Gerald, you know, um, you, you took a swipe at quite a few things there. I, mean, I, I work in artificial intelligence, and that got a bit of a bashing. And I should reveal that my name is Richard Harvey, which is a French name, which also uh, came up for a bit of a discussion. I mean, I feel as though you've given us a, a, you know, one of these Michelin-starred meals. And I, I remember going to one of these things where every course... Uh, was another treat, and it felt like that in your lecture. It went, you know, I thought... Oh, he's coming to the end here. Oh, no, there's another little tasty morsel uh, coming my way. And I feel absolutely full. I mean, I'm absolutely full of um, replete of ideas. You know, Arab Spring to Zigbee, data obesity, that was a new term that I like, and from selfies to six packs. Um, you know, LOL, I should say. I mean, normally, we take some questions, but I, I think there's a sort of 
rather nice set of wine glasses waiting for us outside. And Gerard, as you can see, is one of those rare, rare people in computer science who is a human being. You know? <laughs> and um, I know he'd be delighted to talk to you at the back of the, uh, at the, back of the lecture theatre, and uh, so, so would all of us. So, Gerard, on behalf of everyone here, let me say thank you very much.